Okay. Uh, so I would like to introduce you my colleague here at Boazic University, Ayfer Bartu Jandan. Jandan. Um, so when we were organizing the summer school, fellows asked for an anthropologist uh, specifically. And uh, so here we have our anthropologist. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, she is here at Boazic University at the Department of Sociology. And uh, her research interests mainly include uh, urban anthropology, political anthropology, uh, space, power, and gender. And uh, she has uh, um, very good uh, work on Istanbul as well. And I'm sure she will be telling us a bit this uh, during the session as well. So the floor is yours. Thanks. First, I'll start by sitting, and then I'll stand up. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me and insisting to have an anthropologist. Um, but when I first heard that from Begüm, I was a bit worried um, because I wasn't sure what you were expecting, insisting on anthropology. Uh, and this, this worry has to do with usually the expectations from anthropology, because when, when people um, think of anthropology still, given the, the changes and transformations in the discipline and all the debate and, and so on, still when many people think of anthropology, they think of these exotic places, exotic people, you know, um, anthropologists telling us about all these stories that we're not familiar with. Uh, well, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm not that kind of an anthropologist, and I don't think anthropology should be conducted in that way. Um, and I'll, I'll certainly come back to this observation later on. Of course, I will be talking about different worlds and how, how a different world is possible and what anthropology could contribute to that debate. Uh, but certainly, I'm not going to be talking about exotic places and people and exotic stories. Um, and, and that is also uh, usually the, the general division of labor in social sciences. I did my uh, graduate studies in the States the division of labor that exists there is sociologists deal with um, North America, anthropologists deal with the rest of the world. So, um, and, uh, and sociologists talk about structures, um, economy, serious things, and anthropologists talk about the fancy, exotic, uh, irrelevant things. Uh, you know, they, they add touches, colors, and texture, and so on. So that's not the kind of anthropology that I'm um, uh, I, I try to do, and um, anyway, I'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Um, so what I thought I could do is, huh, I'm a Mac person, so I'm paralyzed when I... <laughs> sure. Huh? What? That's an exotic category? Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, well, tr I'll try to do several things at the same time. I hope this will work out. Um, in, in the first maybe 10 minutes, maybe less than that, well, 10 minutes, um, mm -hmm. what I'll do is give you a sense of, uh, I'm not sure how much you're familiar with anthropology. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. Um, but I'll, I'll try to give you a sense of um, what I call anthropology's engagement with the environment, how in a uh, contribution that anthropology and the debates in anthropology can have 
for environmental discussions. Um, and also, I was just telling Jason that I will have a different take on the Anthropocene debate, but we'll, we'll also talk about that later. So um, I thought I could just give you a sense of some of the things that are being debated within anthropology, obviously in conversation with geographers, political ecologists, and other fields as well. So give you a sense of that and mention a couple of names whose work I find quite exciting and interesting, although I don't agree with all of the things that they are doing. Uh, and then move on with um, some examples from the work that I've been conducting, uh, not only in Istanbul, but I'll, I'll also talk about the other life that I had, uh, previous work, research, and I'll, I'll give you through um, examples from my own research, I'll also try to demonstrate some of, the, some of these contributions that I want to highlight. And I think many of the, the things that I want to um, just throw out will raise series of questions that hopefully we can discuss during uh, the discussion. So I'll start with um, um, this naming, labels, ecological anthropology versus environmental anthropology. So what do anthropologists call themselves when they work on environmental issues? So this is a, uh, well, in anthropology, everything is very highly contested, you know, and so on and so forth. This is also another contested area. Uh, what do we call ourselves? Well, well, many people refuse to call themselves anything. You know, they just call themselves anthropologists working on environmental issues. But, but I think this, at least this distinction is actually very useful. Ecological anthropology versus environmental anthropology. Although just keeping in mind that many anthropologists even refuse to call themselves environmental anthropology because we have a trauma. I mean, every discipline has a trauma. The trauma has to do with the kind of ecological anthropology that has been conducted in 1960s and 70s. So this was um, really a, a traumatic and very tense relationship between social anthropologists and ecological anthropologists. Some of them were biological anthropologists, physical anthropologists, and physical anthropology, even the name itself, uh, could be quite traumatic for many social anthropologists because when you look at, think of the history of anthropology, physical anthropology has this unfortunate history of being associated with racism, colonialism, um, and all, all those bad things. So, well, ecological anthropologists, some of them were physical anthropologists, biological anthropologists, and the, the kind of anthropology's engagement with environment was very much um, had, had a particular vision in 1960s and, and 70s. Uh, it was very much a positivist science. It defined itself as a positivist science, and it, it didn't have anything to do with social anthropology. So it was mainly talking about adaptive strategies, um, you know, how much rainfall will determine a certain cultural behavior, it's very much um, environmentally deterministic um, studies, uh, and talking a lot about these adaptive strategies, how much calorie people intake uh, of calories, how much they uh, consume, and, and so on and so forth. And the, the unit of analysis was really the sort of a, a village or their people, their own people, the sort of small scale societies, and they, they could tell you everything you want to know about the physical conditions, the environmental conditions, with no relevance, with no um, concern whatsoever about questions of power, questions about the world, questions about the world system, questions about inequality, questions about gender. So that was really how ecological anthropology or anthropologists who were dealing with some form of environmental issues worked with, worked within that paradigm of 1960s and 70s. Well, when we look at more sort of contemporary anthropologists working on environmental issues, it's a completely different picture. And we're not talking about the same group of people who change their minds. We're talking about a completely different groups of people, academics. So there's this emergence of new, new I, I don't think it's a generational thing, but still a new generation of anthropologists dealing with environmental issues, but asking completely different kinds of questions. Very much influenced by geography, very much influenced by the world system, very much influenced by um, uh, work of geographers, political ecologists, and, and so on. And I think geographers and political ecologists and economists also started learning a lot from anthropology. So there is this convergence of 
um, social scientists, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, um, uh, that history, convergence of social science scientists who um, well, that's why political ecology is so attractive, because it brings together all these different disciplines. Um, geographers discovering, in a way, fieldwork methodology as a new methodology, sort of rediscovering anthropology. Anthropologists discovering uh, geographers talking about space, place, things are happening in a place, there are histories, there's, there's a global history, and, and so on. So the kind of um, environmental anthropology, I'm just using it as a shortcut, the kind of environmental anthropology or, or the kind of anthropology that I'll be talking about today um, is drastically different from this ecological anthropology of 1960s and 70s. So the, the kinds of questions that, that we are engaged now, um, this group of, of anthropologists, as I said, it's, it's really, um, you can think of it as this area of political ecology inequalities, gender, uh, and so on. And there have been many um, influences there. Um, different theories about nature, science studies had a lot of impact in, in, in um, uh, organizing this field. Development studies, well, feminist theory, environmental history, post-colonial studies, political ecology. So, so this environmental anthropology that is conducted now is very much um, uh, they, they feed on these different theories as well. Um, so these are just a, a background information influences and, and the drastic, dramatic differences in the contemporary anthropology, the way they deal with, we deal with environmental issues. Let me say a couple of things very briefly about um, again, what what kind of contributions or what are the ongoing debates and issues that are uh, that anthropology, the kind of anthropology that I um, just told you about, anthropology can bring um, to discussions of environmental issues? Well, one has to do with, I think, um, methodology. Uh, Fieldwork methodology, as I said, has been very attractive as a methodology, uh, looking at everyday life practices, um, hearing the stories of ordinary people, how they go about in their daily lives, how they interact with the environment, what they do, what they believe in, um, how, how they live, how they are integrated into the world system, and, and so on. So this methodology, I think, again, we don't need a, a longer discussion on this at the moment, but this fieldwork methodology has been, I think, one of the important contributions um, in when we think of anthropology and its, its engagement with, with the environment. Um, and it brings in the stories of and the experiences of ordinary people um, in, in our discussions and debates about nature, environment, and so on. Because all these big concepts like social class, gender, they are very much lived experiences. I mean, we are talking about real people in, in specific historical settings doing things, right? Uh, so that is really, um, that sounds very mundane and ordinary, but that's, that's really, um, I think, the power of, of anthropology as well. But there are a couple of other um, issues which um, I think I'll just list some of them. Um, contributions, discussions and debates that are, these are ongoing debates and ongoing research taking these questions seriously. One has to do with question of scale. Uh, we did come a long way from uh, just talking about our little communities, face-to-face -face communities, villages. Um, anthropologists are famous, you know, talking about their own villages, their own sites, and, and so on. Yes, we still do that, but obviously we're not, we, we're not under this, the impression that there is this tiny little locality that, that has nothing to do with the rest of the world. Um, so there are various attempts by many anthropologists trying to problematize the scale. So we talk about this local global nexus, so what it means to be local, what it means to be global, and the intersections between them, north and south, indigenous versus foreign, uh, or indigenous or non-Western versus Western. So we actually problematize many of these, um, what some called question of scale. So rather than, so these notions that people assume and people expect from anthropologists this local locality let's hear about the local right so anthropologists rather than assuming what local is or what locality is we try to conduct work or they try to demonstrate 
uh, what we can say production of locality, the historical production of locality and also production of globality. So rather than just understanding local and um, with its own histories and, and so on and just thinking of global as something that is coming and just changing everything, so now we try to understand um, the, the production of both what we mean by global, globality, and I think Jason's um, um, talk was very informative in that sense. We can't just assume that. We need to historicize that. We need to talk about real actors. We need to talk about uh, different forms that capitalism takes in different regions of the world. So we, need, we really started talking about, rather than assuming this distinction itself, talking about production of locality and production of globality. So rather than, again, talking about exotic, pristine, untouched people, um, again, thinking of Eric Wolf, you know, people without history, and they, they were never in history people who haven't been um, untouched or haven't been part of either a regional or a global network of exchange, interaction, and, and so on. I mean, it took on different forms, obviously. So that's one of the, I think, contributions and interesting debates that are, that's an ongoing debate in, in anthropology, and very interesting work and attempts to theorize these distinctions and, and question of scale. Um, another contribution, I think, or an important theme is, uh, as I said, the sustained critique of romantic and essentialized images of the indigenous. Right? There, is, there has been this fascination with the indigenous way of doing things, non-Western way of doing things. And I'm not saying this to undermine the indigeneity. Is there such a word? Yeah. Um, or what the indigenous, could con the indigenous practices could contribute to our understanding of environment, ecology, and, and so on. But there is a very important danger of romanticizing and essentializing this, the indigenous. Right. That's why at the beginning I said that I'm not going to give you the sort of romanticized, exotic view of the indigenous. Uh, but this is something that I want to come back to in a minute, because there are so many very interesting attempts and experiments, I would say, to theorize what we mean by indigenous, what we mean by local. I mean, we're all aware that it's not a homogeneous thing, it's not a homogeneous entity. There are class differences, historical differences, regional differences. Um, so. Um, uh, and there are many attempts to theorize uh, what we mean by indigeneity and the contribution of that. So this is not a call for undermining um, the indigenous or the indigenous groups, but uh, calling for a different kind of formulation and uh, theorization of that. Um, and also we have to keep in mind, I'm going to be very brief about this, that we have to keep in mind that especially when we look at some environmental um, movements in different parts of the world, many indigenous groups of people actually take up this essentialized images, and Spivak calls that strategic essentialism, they, they, they use it knowingly and consciously. So they portray a particular image of themselves to the world, so that they can be visible, so that they can be heard in the world, because that's the only way they can be seen. So that, that's another interesting uh, discussion that we might come back to. But this is, this is sustained critique of romantic, essentialized indigeneity. And emphasis on contested nature of natures. So we are aware that there are multiple natures, different ways in which different groups relate to um, natures. Uh, and contestation is, uh, is an important part of that, uh, but we also need to be aware of, I mean, I mean exactly as Jason said, cap that's how capitalism works. I mean, contestation, which came out as, a, as a, I think, a very progressive um, concept, it has been immediately appropriated by World Bank, for example. I mean, I, unfortunately, I did work with World Bank people at some point in my life, uh, and contestations now have become stakeholders. Right? All of a sudden, you have a list of groups of people with different relation with nature, environment, and now they become, in the more mainstream international agencies, they become stakeholders. So that's, that's another sort of um, uh, in interesting area there. So, um, and lastly, interest in globalization and in the transnationality of movements and, and discourses. So different attempts in understanding both the environmental movements and discourses, how they travel, the global nature of it, and what we mean by transnationality of 
uh, of all of these things. So this is very briefly just to give you a sense of um, some debates, contributions, um, and themes that might be relevant, and I do want to elaborate on, on some of them later on. But now I want to give um, uh, examples from two uh, works by, by anthropologists. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with these uh, names, but these are people I think who deal, who engage with these issues quite a lot. This, especially this question of scale, local, global, north, south, and also this question of indigeneity and, and different ways of theorizing that. One of them is Anna Singh. How many of you are familiar with her work? Yeah, the mushrooms. Um, well, she doesn't only work on mushrooms, but um, I find her work um, really inspiring. I, I find, I mean, I disagree with some of her analysis, and I find some of her work quite inaccessible in terms of jargon and, and so on, and, and I think that's a problem. Um, but I find her work quite inspiring in terms of um, trying to, simultaneously trying to understand the production of locality. This, this project on Matsutake uh, mushroom stories, that's, that's the website of the, of the project. You just click on one of these places. So what, what she tries to do is tracing, um, I mean, I fi find this in, in some ways similar to what Sidney Mintz did with sugar, in a way. Sort of trying to trace the story of these mushrooms, uh, the, the meanings attributed to them, how in different parts of the world people engage with this, and how this becomes a commodity in the, inter in the global market. So you can actually click on these, um, these stories and, um, and get a sense of uh, what, how people engage with this environment, uh, what it means to grow, collect, not grow, but collect uh, these mushrooms and how they become part of the, the global commodity uh, chain. So she has also other interesting, and she, she's now also involved in, I think, a very interesting project on, on the Anthropocene. I'll come back to that later. Um, the other anthropologist, again, how many of you are familiar with is Elizabeth Povinelli's um, work? She's, she's another very interesting anthropologist, I think, who has been working on recently more sort of more explicitly environmental issues. And the, the, the most recent project uh, that she's involved in is actually an attempt to, um, to again, theorize this indigeneity and uh, facilitating the indigenous populations that she's been working with in Australia, giving them um, uh, or working with them um, to, uh, for them to be able to express themselves and their relationship with the environment, not in a romanticized and an exotic way, but this is, uh, this is a project, Carabing uh, project, um, multimedia project um, that we can talk about later on if you want. Um, but these are interesting anthropologists, I think just a few, naming a few, but dealing with these issues that I've just mentioned, these questions of scale, uh, indigeneity, uh, globalization, transnationality, and, and so on. The others, I'll, I'll skip parts of this because this is, I want to move on to Istanbul part. Um, well, we can come back to this in the question and answer. <laughs> yeah, exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, well, the Anthropocene debate and urban political ecology. The Anthropocene debate uh, is also, I think, interesting in terms of um, I'll just, I just want to say a couple of things about these, and then I want to move on to, to Istanbul research and, and engage with these questions within that, that context. Uh, and I think that will also give you a background, because I think you have field trips to some, some of these sites, and you will be talking about Istanbul case as, as an uh, interesting case, to say the least. Um, well, the Anthropocene debate, the way when I was listening to Jason, I was a bit... Um, surprised by the, the, the mutually exclusive distinction that he made between um, sort of capitalism or cap capitalism, I can't pronounce that word, and, and Anthropocene. Uh, the way the Anthropocene debate is translated into, into anthropology is, is something a bit different. Um, the, um, what, the way many anthropologists have, have been hearing this debate is reconfiguration of the relationship between the physical and the social, the physical and the cultural. I told, I told you about the sort of traumatic relationship of the physical anthropology, the physical things and social and cultural. But the Anthropocene debate, and I think some of the, the discussions in, in political anthropology, 
opened up a new space within social anthropology where social anthropologists, in a way, restarted talking to, having conversations with biologists, for example. I mean, trying to overcome the trauma and re-talking, having new conversations, and that relationship between the physical and the social and cultural is being reconfigured, I think. And, and that part I find very interesting. And, and also, um, well, we know that, well, of course, the Anthropocene debate brings in human agency at the center of the debate, but as anthropologists well know, uh, we know that human beings, we can't just talk about this homogeneous entity of human beings. I mean, there are differences, there are regional differences, class differences, and, and so on, and human beings do things, right? And we need to understand capitalism is one of the important forces there, I mean, important aspects of, well, or one of the very important things that they do, they have been doing. And, and they, obviously, there are certain actors associated with that. So the Anthropocene debate actually opens up a space within social anthropology to rethink about capitalism, to historicize in capitalism, talking about the kinds of things that human beings have been doing in the world. So in that sense, I don't find them really mutually exclusive, but that's, so in that sense, I find that debate very interesting and inspiring for anthropology and the anthropological work that, that we do. And, and it also raises for anthropologists the question of responsibility. So who have been doing this? Who are these people? Because capitalism, yes, it's, it's a system, but it is a system um, implemented by certain actors. So that's, um, that's, that brings in, I think, an interesting discussion within, within anthropology. And urban political ecology, again, that's another interesting field, um, or the way political ecology has been what I call translated into urban anthropology, and that is, in a way, sort of the area that I've been working on. Uh, it raises really interesting questions about um, uh, urban, what we call urban, and this completely um, uh, being very critical of this distinction between nature or rural and urban, nature and urban, so an, an, an attempt to understand creation of natures and different kinds of natures in the urban context. So that's, um, so these are really background themes and issues that, that anthropologists have been dealing with. So what I'm, I'm going to do is actually continue talking about Istanbul case as a way of um, again demonstrating um, how, or in, in my research and how part of this research I collaborated with other people, how we try to engage with some of the questions that urban political, and political ecology has been raising in, um, in, in the context of, of Istanbul. And usually the expectations in, in urban anthropology, when you look at the history of urban anthropology and urban sociology, the expectation is, again, similar to expectations with, with anthropology in general, the expectation is to study down, studying the poor people, studying the marginal groups in the city. So when, when people thought of urban anthropology, they always, that was, again, immediate division of labor. Well, if you're an anthropologist, you go to the squatter settlements and you work there. Again, I'm not saying that that's not important. But I think in terms of production of knowledge, that's that raises a series of questions about what kind of knowledge is produced and, and for whom, and what, what are the kinds of things that we take for granted. So the kind of work that I've been conducting in, in Istanbul, actually, well, I've conducted work in squatter settlements, but also in gated communities, and try to understand both of them simultaneously, and, and the relationship between the two, and especially when we think of environmental issues um, we have to really take, we have to study up. We really need to understand um, the nature of urban problems because whenever urban problems are debated in the context of Istanbul or any big city, it's always the poor who is polluting the environment. It's always the squatter settlements who are using um, electricity, who are using um, uh, in, in, in inappropriate sort of portion of um, uh, water, polluting the water reserves and, and so on. But places like gated communities, places that upper classes occupy, have been aestheticized and they haven't, they have been normalized and they have been really kept out of the equation when, when we're especially talking about environmental issues and environmental problems in the cities. 
Um, so those were really some of the background issues that we had in mind when we started um, this project on, on Istanbul. So let me move on with, uh, with some observations about Istanbul and elaborate on, on some of these issues as we go along. Well, what I'm going to do is um, uh, give you a sense of a um, series of projects that are ongoing in, in Istanbul. I mean, Istanbul, I don't know how whether you had a chance to go around a bit, but it's like a construction site. Something is happening, and, and that's not a coincidence because the whole economy is actually run on the sort of construction sector, but there are different types of projects, and um, I will be more <coughs> brief on some, but elaborate on some for uh, in terms of environmental, the environmental impact and, and why we need to care about these projects. Um, well, if you, if you were here a month earlier, probably I would be more pessimistic, but now, you know, after the elections, I'm a bit more <laughs> optimistic, and, and we'll see how many of these projects will really be actualized. Some of them are already actualized, but um, we're so happy that, you know, it's the 13% that made us happy, but that was a very important, very significant number, yeah. Uh, well, the mega projects, um, I'll just, um, well, one set of projects are what we might call mega projects, and Istanbul is not unique in that sense. I mean, the, uh, it might be a bit more crazy, but um, it's not unique in the sense that, um, I mean, we, we, I mean that in terms of the, uh, the contemporary sort of way in which capitalism operates, I mean, mega projects are really important there. And same in, in Istanbul, um, one project, Kanal Istanbul, and uh, the prime minister at the time called it a crazy project, and it's a crazy project, is in terms of its scale and in terms of what it tries to do, um, it, uh, it try, well, you can't see it properly. So that's the real Bosphorus, the existing one, right? Um, and there are two options to open a canal either here or there uh, between the Black Sea and uh, Marmara Sea. I mean, it is in terms of the scale uh, and so on, it's really a crazy project. Um, and the estimated cost 15 billion US dollars. Um, well, I'm very hopeful that it won't happen. Um, and many uh, environmental activists have been talking about the environmental impact of this, obviously, I mean, completely changing the, the whole geography of the, of the city. And, and we all know that this is actually for urban development. This is, and the prime minister at the time also said very explicitly that he wants to create a second Istanbul, you know, as if we didn't have enough, you know, first Istanbul. So the, um, another, uh, I mean, we can go back to some of these mega projects if you want at, at the end. I just want to be very brief because I want to talk about some other things. Uh, but this is just to give you a sense of the kind of also environmental struggles that people have been running from one demonstration to another and trying to make sense of this all. Um, uh, the third airport, uh, so that's the uh, supposed to be the location of that, which is also related with the third bridge that is, is it still being built? Is, it is, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway. So um, the third uh, airport um, and that area, the third airport and the third bridge, you might sort of vaguely see there, it's really the last green areas in, in the city. It will completely sort of destroy the whole sort of ecology there. Um, estimated cost $29 billion, it's huge, mega, um, and the third uh, bridge, um, obviously this, um, that's, the, that's supposed to be the third bridge. I mean, we can raise a series of questions that are extremely relevant also for political ecology. Um, who, who needs that bridge? Who needs that kind of private transportation? Does, is it really meaningful to invest in um, that kind of transport? rather than others, or whose need is that, and, and so on. Um, and, and also, in, in terms of the, uh, the impact of mega projects, there's a whole sort of literature on that, which are very relevant for Istanbul case as well. But let, so these are one set of uh, projects that are ongoing in, in Istanbul. The, um, the other set has to do with, again, I'm not sure how many of these will be really implemented, um, building sort of seven skyscrapers um, um, representing seven hills of Istanbul, sort of creating a small Dubai there. Uh, privatization of a very controversial Galata port project, privatization of um, this area and, and catering to cruise tourism. Um, 
and this is also very much related, I think, with privatization of many public spaces in the city. So this is, a, this is one line of contestation in the city, as many other cities. Uh, well, famous Taksim Square military barracks, um, rebuilding, the, that's the Gezi Park. Uh, well, it's still, the park is still there. So, um, so, but this was the project, um, the pedestrianization of, of Taksim Square and um, uh, and building the, the rebuilding the military barracks as shopping mall. Well, at some point it was termed urban museum, city museum. Uh, well, it's still a park. Um, so, and, and the, these mega projects, you should also get the sense that the way we learn here about these mega projects is actually you wake up one morning and you are told that there's going to be this kind of a project. So this decision-making process is actually part of the environmental struggles in, in Istanbul context as well. Another type of series of projects that I will spend a bit more time on is what has been referred to as urban transformation projects, UTPs. You might sort of hear this over and over again. And they also take on different forms. These are, um, the scale is very, very different. Uh, one kind of scale, one type of urban transformation projects is to invite star architects to Istanbul and give them literally helicopter tour of some of these neighborhoods. And this is a neighborhood on the, well, it doesn't look this way now. It's a, it's a very industrial, working class neighborhood on the Asian side. And when I'm talking about neighborhood, this is, this is supposed to be Kartal. I'm talking about hundred, approximately 100,000 people so that's the scale of the neighborhood that I'm talking about. So Zaha Hadid, um, the Iraqi British star architect, she was invited to Istanbul, given a helicopter tour of the, of the neighborhood, and she was asked to design a new neighborhood there. Well, with one exception that, you know, she didn't need to take into account 100,000 people who are already living there, right? So this is a working class neighborhood. So this is the kind of design, the futuristic design that she came up with <coughs> obviously very much a gent gentrification um, project and there is no account of what's going to happen to these 100,000 people. I mean, it's one thing when an architect has a vision, but it's another thing when the mayor of Istanbul declares that this is going to be the future of this neighborhood. So this is still a pending um, project. I mean, hopefully it will still pen there. Um, the, um, uh, another... Uh, Again, similar kind of urban transformation projects. Um, this is the, you might have, this also got international attention. This is the Roman uh, neighborhood, Sulukule. It's not an illegal settlement. It's just a poor Roman population live in, in the center of the city. Um, sort of re rehabilitation. I mean, there are these fancy words for, for these transformation projects. Rehabilitation of the, of the neighborhood. Um, they also make use of some laws which, um, which talks about um, preservation of heritage and so on. But it's, you could see that the new Sulukule, um, could, these people could not really afford to live in these places. So the new Sulukule, they, they have been dislocated or relocated to really out of nowhere up there, Toki Kayabashi Konda. So they used to be here, so they are relocated there to this kind of housing. This, these are mass housing administration, um, so-called public housing projects. But the interesting thing about, I think, the contemporary government is that the argument about these urban transformation projects, especially this one, and, and in a minute I'll show some squatter settlement, re so-called rehabilitation projects, the argument is that um, they're not saying that, well, we're going to do this in spite of you. The argument is that, well, we are doing this to upgrade the housing conditions of the urban poor. But what is actually happening in practice is that these people are relocated because there is no way that they could either afford these, these houses because they need to buy these new houses. Um, and, uh, and they are relocated to, um, to somewhere else in, in the city. I mean, there is no way that they could actually um, sustain a living uh, there. So this is the new Sulukule. And, uh, similar kinds of projects in the city, in Beolo, um, uh, poor population sort of renting these places, especially sort of the Kurdish migrants, um, um, transsexual sex workers, 
uh, some students. So this part of this neighborhood, so this is going to be the new Tarlabush. And you could easily see that there is no way that the existing population could actually survive. So it's a, it's a gentrification uh, project. But the, the ones that I want to um, say a bit more, and, and I think more relevant to our discussion, previous discussion about contribution of anthropology, is that um, uh, squatter settlement transformation uh, projects. Geja uh, Kondo, that literally means built overnight. That's the, that's the squatter settlement in, in Turkish, like favelas and, and so on. I mean, Geja Kondo's story is really interesting in Istanbul um, because the squatter settlements, while well, on paper they are, they are referred to as illegal settlements, right? Uh, but the legality and illegality of squatter settlements are highly problematic and it's a very confusing picture, actually. Because the way squatter settlements worked in, in Istanbul case is that, um, I mean, I always argue that Gece Kondu has been the state's urban housing policy. You can't have whole neighborhoods built without the state knowing about it, right? I mean, we're talking about huge neighborhoods. So the way it worked was that it worked as a sort of a redistributive system. So Istanbul, when it was an industrial city, you needed cheap labor, right? So there's agricultural transformation. So people migrate to the city. They need housing. They need labor. So you need that labor in the city, right, in the 70s, well, 60s, 70s. So you need that labor. And these people need housing, right? But the owners of the factories are not willing to provide the housing. The state is not willing to provide the housing. So Geja Kondo squatter settled settlement is actually the solution uh, to this housing problem. And right before local elections, the state, the municipalities retrospectively legalize some of these neighborhoods. They give them temporary papers or title deeds and, and so on. And that's how urban politics operated for years in Istanbul, not only in Istanbul, but in many cities in, in, in Turkey. But things change, changed from sort of 2000 onwards. And I won't get into a detailed discussion about that. Chal Arkader calls it sort of the urban land properly became a commodity in, in, this, in this period. Um, and, uh, and the AKP, the ruling, ruling party, actually changed its policies about squatter settlements. So instead of don't ask, don't tell policy or urban politics running on this sort of retrospectively legalizing these, these settlements, they, um, they introduced these urban transformation projects with the argument that they're going to upgrade the housing conditions of the urban poor and the squatter settlements you can't, there's a, there's a social stratification also within squatter settlements. Um, some of them are in better conditions, some of them are semi-legal and, and so on. So it's a very complicated picture. But the, the squatter settlement transformation projects, the way they operate is that, so the Mass Housing Administration, you don't really have a choice if you don't have some form of a title deed. So you have to make an agreement with Mass Housing Administration so your house is demolished and you, you sign an agreement with Mass Housing Administration and you are relocated to uh, the so-called public housing projects and you pay the installments, the rest of the, the money for the house in 20 or 25 years subsidized um, installments. Okay. Um, but here the assumption is that everyone is able to pay that installment, but I'll come back to that in, in a minute. So what happens with, with this land is, so they're open to um, more middle class or upper middle class residential housing. So they, it's not that they're not unrelated. So the, the places that they uh, leave um, are, um, it's open for construction and for cons constructing middle class and upper middle class uh, residential settlements. I'll come back to this squatter settlements and what happens to these people when they're relocated and why that's a problem and why we need to, um, and where environmental struggles actually come into the picture. Um, so these are the, the set of urban transformation projects that are implemented by the state. There are also other kinds of residential settlements in the city that cater to 
upper classes or upper middle classes and some middle classes, which take the form of gated communities in the city. But they have been, as I said, they have been normalized. Very few social scientists actually conduct research in, in, on these gated communities. And I think they, they, they pose an incredible environment. They are environmental disasters in, in many ways. But their, uh, their impact on the environment and um, their relationship to the city really becomes invisible in, in the sense that Maria Kaika talks about it. I mean, it becomes uh, as if they have nothing to do with the rest of the city, uh, as if they are sort of aesthetically, they are normalized, they are, they are the way to go. And I'll give you several examples, and I'm using the real names of these gated um, communities. Um, water is a huge, big thing. So there is, there are different ways in which, I mean, I, I have been interested in different natures that are created uh, within these gated communities. And the, these natures are also used in different ways. One is in, in marketing these gated communities because they promise, very similar to some ones in Latin America, India, uh, Los Angeles, and, and so on, they promise nature, right? They promise you a life uh, in the middle of nature. But the kind of nature that they are talking about is very much a simulated nature. Well, I'm very much aware that there is no pristine nature and all that debate and so on, but, but this is a problem. This is, this is simulated nature, and, and water is very, very important in the water and forest. These are two very important aspects of this promise of a green lifestyle. And more and more, these gated communities are promoted as green settlements. Um, and this is not problematized. Bosphorus city, so you have a simulation of Bosphorus. You can just imagine the amount of water that is pumped in to create this Bosphorus city. I mean, th th there wasn't water there. Um, and, and also the maintenance cost of this for, for the rest of the city. Uh, well, aqua city. Um, lagoon houses, these are all artificial lakes that are created and obviously in order to, to do something for the mosquitoes, there, there's an enormous amount of uh, chemicals, pesticides, so maintenance fees are, are enormous. Um, terrace gardens, so more and more, as I said, these gated communities are very much, um, they, well, they are marketed as sort of promising a life outside of the, the problems and the dirt and the, the whatever of the city, promising a green, uh, promising a life in nature, and what they call, non-embarrassingly, in harmony with nature. And, um, and this, is, this, is, this is not problematized. This is taken as what some people call sort of green aesthetics, right? This is, this is the way to go. The terrace gardens, I mean, this huge, very controversial, illegal shopping mall, Zorlu Center, is, I think it does have a LEED certificate or something. So it's, it, it promotes itself as a green uh, shopping mall. I think that that's an oxymoron. You can't have a green shopping mall. Um, and these terrace gardens, I mean, this project, this uh, gated community, it, it promotes, it talks about how much of its energy it, it produces, how, how it is green and, and so on. And, and I think, the really the extreme form of this is this project. You know, how natural we are. Um, the, the name of the project is Resim Istanbul, Picture Istanbul, and it's promoted in this way, and this is, yeah. Um, it, a different, a new kind of settlement also emerged, which, which I think has a different kind of relationship with nature. Um, creation of nature. Uh, these are. This is not. This is more than a gated community. This is. This is actually the new trend now in Istanbul. You have everything there. It's a compound in a way. You have the residences. You have the offices. You have the shopping malls within the compound, right? And this is called Vadi Istanbul, uh, Valley Istanbul, and it is constructed within a valley. So obviously getting rid of many of the trees there. But it's promoted as Valley Istanbul, so wouldn't you want to live in Valley Istanbul, right? Um, another one, um, I think this was stopped, um, trying to be built within a state forest, Maslak 1453. 1453 is the conquest of Istanbul. 
But um, 1453 also points to something else. That is the um, uh, length of the shopping strip within, it is 100 and, uh, thousand and, well, 1453 meters of shopping strip that it has within it. Um, pointing to that. So there, there's, there's something interesting in terms of this creation of new kinds of natures. Uh, what is happening is actually many of these places are designed, actually there's a very good paper about Berlin on this, there's this new design practice uh, that we observe in cities and I think it's interesting to think in terms of environmental impact and also relationship with the environment and nature. This new architectural design uh, it designs spaces as if they are open and public spaces, right? So this shopping strip is actually, it, it's called street, right? But there's nothing street about it. It is within this compound. You can't just walk in there. You can't, not anyone can walk in there. It's highly regulated, but it is designed as if it is an open space, right? Um, but it's actually a private space. So it's actually more than privatization of public space, but it's creating and designing new um, private spaces. Um, this is another example of what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to show. This is Maidan shopping mall. Maidan means plaza, right? And this is, again, designing a shopping mall as if this is a public space, as if this is an open space. Uh, but this is actually a highly regulated space, so there are many sort of security people around, private security people around, and, and so on. This is very interesting because this is located in, uh, on the other side, Asian side, Umraniye, uh, where there are gated communities and also squatter settlements. And on Sundays, it's really an interesting experience because many sort of young people from the squatter settlements would want to come to this shopping mall and there are always tensions, who gets in and who's out. And it's very difficult to sort of regulate that in this kind of a so-called open space or spaces that are designed as public spaces. Um, other trend in, within shopping malls, this is within Istinia Park shopping mall, sort of an upscale shopping mall. It's called um, this fake tree, fake lighting, and uh, it is called um, a coffee uh, more sort of ordinary coffee shop. It's called that. Um, and coffee shop and people sit, they, they know that this is a fake tree, fake lighting and, and so on. It's highly regulated spaces where you enjoy a particular kind of nature. Right? Um, and another shopping mall and you have uh, within it a place, the whole food court is called Mahalle, neighborhood. Right? This is within a shopping mall, again, highly regulated and, and so on. Um, so so this, this gives you, I think, a sense of, how much time do we have until? If you want to leave half an hour for the special, you have five minutes. Five minutes, oh my god, okay. Um, all right, um, so, uh, so this, this gives you a sense of the, the urban scene in a way, the settlements, the shopping malls and um, uh, this really urgent need, I think, to problematize um, rather than squatter settlements themselves, but, but the, the, these kinds of gated communities, the kinds of shopping malls that actually market themselves as um, sort of aesthetically pleasing, green, and, and so on. The, um, and we conducted research in, in two different parts of, of Istanbul. There, that is the, the gated communities. Um, I won't get into it, but this, this is how it looks. This is sort of one gated community. This is also interesting urban phenomena. I mean, what do you call this place? It's one gated community next to another. So it's not a neighborhood. It's not a town. It's just a new urban phenomena. It's one gated community. This is just one uh, with its own facilities in it. With They also have educational facilities. So you don't really need to leave this space. Um, so, um, uh, I'll, I'll skip, and it had, they have their own sort of private schools, private hospitals, shopping malls, restaurants, and supermarkets, and, and so on. So you, can, you don't need to leave this 
uh, compound, I don't know what to call it, I mean really sort of set of gated, gated communities. But, but this kind of urban development um, is rarely problematized. Again, that is, that is the norm and that is, that is perceived to be environmentally sustainable and, and it's also marketed as, as such. But I want, to, I want to go back to one of these uh, urban transformation projects where we conducted uh, research and, and go back to this point about indigeneity, the, the local, and uh, what is it that we are actually losing in this, in this process. So the, the challenge is how can we talk about the locality, indigeneity, and in this context squatter settlements without romanticizing them, but still providing a critique of the existing urban transformation project. So that's, that's really the challenge that I want to talk about. So, the, uh, so this is where I'm, uh, well, I'm, we can skip this, there's another sort of star architect project here. So this is, this is the area that I'll, I'll be talking about. So there is an Olympic stadium there. Some of you might know that Turkey has this craze for bidding for the Olympics for years. We never managed to get it, hopefully we won't because there's a whole you know, literature on the impact of the Olympics on, on the cities. Uh, but you know, I think Istanbul will still bid for the Olympics, so there's an Olympic stadium there. So this project was promoted as uh, cleaning up the area around the Olympic stadium. So whenever you hear this cleaning up, you can assume that there's going to be a group of people who, who will be relocated, right? So they, they have been relocated from that blue area to this black area to, with the same kind of mechanism that I just mentioned, this uh, urban transformation projects, from the squatter settlement to, so this is the Olympic Stadium, so we were there right during the demolition of the squatter settlement. So this is sort of how it looks like. I mean, there is nothing, obviously, to romanticize about, especially some of these squatter settlements. This area, Ayazma, it has been predominantly populated by Kurdish migrants, uh, starting with 1980s, but in, in 1990s, the population sort of exploded. So they have been settled there. Well, they, they settled there. Uh, this is right next to an industrial zone. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm saying there is nothing to romanticize about this, this neighborhood is that this, is, this was the, the, the squatter settlement in Istanbul where the infant mortality has been the highest. I mean, there is nothing, even that fact itself tells you that there's nothing to romanticize about it. But there is something very important that we've been losing in this process of relocation and so-called upgrading of this squatter settlement. So, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things about that. So these people, so it has been demolished and they have, um, they moved to, um, so they moved to this public housing project. Um, not, not all of these blocks, but, but some of them. So this is, this is I think, one of, the, well, one of the other crazy projects. This was one of the first urban transformation projects of squatter settlements. So we are talking about a Kurdish, predominantly Kurdish population living in this squatter settlement. Um, and they had their gardens. So we're talking about a very poor population who relied heavily on their gardens for survival, right? Um, so when, whenever they, these are people who don't have regular jobs and their income is not stable at all, so they rely heavily on the gardens to sustain themselves, right? So they are moved to this, these apartment buildings where they don't have any garden to, to use. Um, so we are talking about a group of Kurdish population in the middle of this, the surrounding area is known to be ultra right wing nationalist neighborhood, right? So you move this population there, right? An urban poor population there with no gardens. You move them there. And you also put, so this is how it looks. The, the quality of construction is, is awful too. And so these are, were the buildings that they were moved to. They had to move. So the surrounding area is ultra-nationalist um, neighborhood. And the green dots, well, on top of that, you add, you move the police housing there. And guess what happens, right? So you have the Kurdish population 
with police housing in the middle of the compound, surrounded with ultranationalist right-wing population. I mean, I can't, I mean, I'm even embarrassed to give this as an example in my introduction to sociology course. I mean, this is, guess what happens, right? Obviously, it's extremely tense the minute they move there, ethnic violence, I mean, it becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, obviously. Then the argument is that, well, see, the Kurds do not know how to live in an apartment building. There are tensions, there are fights, and, and so on. But the, another thing, I mean, this is, this is really the expected out outcome. But another thing that I'm more interested in, well, I'm also interested in this, but more interested in is that, so this is overnight, this population, and this is not unique to this example, but you can think of this as relevant to other urban transformation projects, especially of the urban poor, but these people become poorer overnight. Why? Because they, they, they have a very limited, unstable income, right? But in the squatter settlements that they were living, so they had the gardens, so they could actually use the gardens to sustain themselves. They also relied heavily on an informal credit system, Veresie. So they go to the market, probably they, they know the owner, not probably, they knew the owner of the market, so they would pay him whenever they had the money. Well, here, there is no way they could do that. I mean, the surrounding neighborhood, no one would do that. I mean, it's it, it obviously based on a trust relationship, right? I mean, they don't trust them. So they don't have the gardens. So overnight, they become poorer. <laughs> and literally, some of the families that we were visiting there were starving. They would just drink tea all day long with lots of sugar, just to keep them going. So, lots of ethnic tension, and this is a highly regulated space. Uh, there, is, there is actually a management um, office there. And these are flyers at the entrance of each apartment building, just telling you rules of living in an apartment building. So it's more like the sort of civilizing mission, right? And in terms of the environment, nature there, so this is the nature you have there. It's again, highly regulated. I mean, these small green spaces, I mean, one, one of the most um, sort of popular way that many of the women in these squatter settlements socialize would gather in front of their houses. So what they started doing here to, to exchange information, some of them are illiterate, some of them do not speak Turkish, they would gather in front of the apartment houses on this green land, green, not land, what is that, plot. And the next time we went there, it was forbidden for them to gather there. So they just sort of, they, they said, this is part of paysage work there, you can't, you can't sit there. So this is very much actually in line with the kind of nature that is created by the municipality. I mean, our prime minister at the time, the president now, he would yell and scream about how environmentalist he is. You know, he counts the number of flowers they've planted. Right? He, he makes a point about how much money they spend on this paysage of the city and, and so on, and, and expect us to be impressed by that. Um, so th there's, a, there's a different kind of nature that is being created there, and, and the kind of thing that these women can do there is actually they, they, tr they go outside of the compound to, to live, to live, trying to live there, I mean, I mean socialize there. So what happens to the squatter settlement that they left? So they be became poorer overnight and, and so on, and guess what happened to the squatter settlement that they left? This is what happened there. So this is another gated compound that is built. And ironically, the, the owner of the construction company, he's, he's really good friends with the, with the current government. Ironically, his slogan, the slogan of his construction company is, uh, everyone in this country deserves a good living. That's the slogan. Um, the, um, well, this is not Istanbul, don't worry. I'll, I'll just wrap up with this. Um, this is actually, um, this is another crazy project by this, in quotes, environmentalist um, businessman in China. He's given many environmental awards um, because he's producing, I think, environmentally friendly air conditioning systems and, and so on. This is his project called Sky City. 
And what he proposes is that this is not this is not completed because it's just too expensive. It's, it's huge. It's uh, 220 stories or something. But what he's proposing is that he proposes this as the environmental solution to urban problems. The way this will work is that it will create its own energy and it will have all of the facilities within the compound, within this. So you don't need to leave. So you have the shopping mall, the educational facilities, residences and, and so on. So you get rid of the traffic problem, you get rid of the air pollution, so this is his dream project, right? I mean, obviously, it, it's, it sounds crazy, extreme, and, and so on. But I think what is happening in Istanbul, as in many other cities, is actually this is really where we are going. Um, so this might sound crazy, but some of the compounds that I'm, I'm showing you are actually operating in this way. I mean, not that they are resolving urban problems, but they, they also, many of them, believe that they are they do have sort of very environmentally friendly uh, compounds and solving uh, urban problems and, and not dealing with it and with no consciousness of their impact on the rest of the city and, and so on. They, they, that becomes invisible. Um, so what is it really that um, we, we need to really, without romanticizing the squatter settlements, how they survive and, and so on, we really need to um, capture the, the everyday practices and how people have been interacting with the environment and, and in what ways that was actually sustainable compared to these. These are really questions that we need to address. And I think many of these issues became very um, uh, explicit during Gezi Park. And probably there has been only one thing that I agreed with the ex-prime minister uh, when he said, well, the Gezi Park is not about a couple of trees. Um, and I agree with him, and that's very rare that I agree with him. It wasn't only about trees. It wasn't only an environmental um, movement in that sense, but it was actually about uh, urban existence, what kind of urbanity that we, we want, and who decides about that? What are the decision-making processes? Um, so that's, I think that's what the Gezi struggle was about, um, and as many of you know, it was violent, and, um, but it was one of the most, now we're being nostalgic about it, but, um, but it, it was a very interesting movement, I think. I mean, we, we still need some, um, uh, we need different terms and time reflection. We need to make some reflection on what the movement was about, the kind of solidarity, who was coming together and why and how and, and so on. And, uh, and let me end with, as I said, it was violent. Let me end with um, an image that some of you are, will be familiar with. These are, this is a group of young people who were killed during the demonstrations. This is an artistic depiction of them together. I mean, they were not together when they were killed, but this is um, a more a new sort of imagination for the city. Let me stop here. Hello, um, I'm Felipe. I'm part of Entitle. I'm from Brazil and working in Coimbra, Portugal. And work also with uh, indigenous uh, groups in Brazil. So I was interested to, to hear a bit more of the ideas of indigeneity, as you, you proposed in the beginning. As I, I could understand, I don't know if that's the way, but like the locals, uh, lo the local communities who has been displaced, you are seeing them as indigenous communities, and they are transformed to poor, they are impoverished. And so this is like a transitory condition to something, and then they can regain their indigenity, or they can reclaim another indigenity, they can fight back for another way to live, I mean, transform back in from poor, to another another condition. I don't know if it's it's. Uh... I don't want to sit anymore. Um, I think I understand your question, um, but 
the problem is that um, almost none of the families that we've met in in the squat when they were in the squatter settlement and they after they they relocated none of the families that we've met and this is very common in many of these projects uh, they could not stay in Istanbul they had to leave the city um, the for various reasons one has to do with the, the ethnic tension the other has to do with the poverty they can't afford these these places um, and uh, for for the relocations to really far ends of the city they, they relied on networks to find jobs so there was no way that they could actually find jobs in the new places that they moved to like the roman population um, well the roman population some of them moved back in in the city uh, but the ones that I showed you, um, that, that uh, the Kurdish population, none of the families that we've met um, managed to survive. And that was very predictable, actually, in, in, the, in the public housing project. So one of the arguments that, that I've been making and some other colleagues have also been making is that this, this urban transformation project directly or indirectly, indirectly is actually a project of pushing the urban poor out of the city. I mean, you, obviously you can't just send the urban poor out of the city, but this is, this is what happens at the end, right? So, um... They are in hmm? they are well, see, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that comfortable, comfortable with, with the term indigenous. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm interested in works that are trying to theorize new concepts, new ways of being. I mean, I, what, what I'm interested in is uh, this more sort of popular slogan of sort of another world is possible, right? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to find ways of making these other worlds possible. I mean, the, the squatter settlements, again, I, I, I'm trying to say this again without trying to romanticize this, but the squatter settlements, the way people live there, it's a, I don't know what else to call it, it's a very organic process. So there are networks that you become a part of. So you migrate to the city. I mean, the Kurdish migration doesn't work that way, but the previous migration of 60s and, and 70s is a chain migration. So you come to the city, you find, um, you, you are integrated into the city through your networks, through the people that you know from your own region, right? You find jobs, uh, you find housing through these networks, and you develop strategies of surviving in the city, right? And that is a particular way of being in the city, right? Um, so, and in that sense, it is, I don't know what else to use, an organic way of, so it, it unfolds, right? It develops, and you have a certain way of being in the city. But with these urban transformation projects, I mean, such top-down projects, without taking into account any of that unfolding and any of those mechanisms or, or, or strategies of surviving in the city, you completely shatter um, this social system. I mean, call it whatever, indigeneity or, I mean, mechanisms of survival, let's, let's put it that way. So you, you completely shatter the mechanisms of survival in the city overnight. And it's very difficult, it is possible, but very difficult to rebuild the kind of, perhaps resilience, the kind of survival strategies that, that these people have developed over time. So in, when I, when I refer to indigeneity, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm more referring to survival strategies that have developed over time and more organically, in a way. Does that answer your question? No. It is complex, actually. Uh, I, I, I'm not expecting one, uh, one clear answer because it doesn't exist, uh, actually. I, I, but I'm wondering exactly, we are working in this, in this way. We're comparing uh, some movements in Campania with some movements in the Amazon, that at the end, what they have in common is the struggle for life, let's say, with, uh, within the environment. So it's very interesting, this approach on the survival. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and for sure, not essentializing the indigenous condition uh, as, as one social category that's ready-made and to use. And so so what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is 
because when you look at the debates in urban sociology or urban anthropology in, in Turkey, um, immediately people problematize squatter settlements as settlements that need to be rehabilitated. There's something wrong with them. So what I'm arguing is that there are things that we, we can learn from these settlements. I mean, we shouldn't romanticize them, but there are things that we can learn from these settlements. And we, I mean, there's nothing wrong with upgrading the housing conditions of the people, but you have to take into account their survival strategies and how, how they survive. I mean, what, no one talks to these people when they completely relocate them. So that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. I mean, there are things that we can learn uh, from the squatter settlements rather than immediately problematizing them and normalizing gated communities. Uh, thanks, Alatay Ferajam. That was a highly inspiring, brilliant speech. Uh, my name is Etam Can. I'm from Istanbul Policy Center, as most of you know. Um, I took just so many notes to comment on uh, because, I mean, it was very rich in detail, I mean, your presentation. Uh, but I would like to start with an example that's very close to my heart since you've mentioned uh, all those projects about Istanbul uh, with uh, use of water and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm from Ankara, as many of you know, and so very recently we had this very terrible uh, TV advertisement on a project called Marina Ankara with Julia Osher and her daughter, uh, who's a big pop singer, and actually they are telling that, oh, mom, shall I just sign up for an Ankara university? And then she says, well, there is no, there is no C in, in Ankara, because unfortunately Ankara is a landlocked city, and eventually this project uh, promises to bring a C to Ankara, uh, which they are actually extracting from a big river nearby that will actually cut the veins that go to the last uh, public lake in Ankara, which is Ottu, Ottu Lake anyway. So um, I think it's just a common pattern that's kind of developing, and this, this has a lot to do with the whole accumulation system and accumulation strategy. Um, but what I really wanted to mention um, was about this, um, the projects that you've mentioned from Zaha Hadid and the whole notion of this helicopter ride and taking a superior view. Um, because I think this resonates well with something else that you've mentioned about cleaning up around the Olympic Stadium. Um, so there is this godlike features of urban transformation. So someone basically have a vision, goes th through uh, the city with a helicopter, sees something, says, well, we changed this, we cleaned this up. And I think this goes hand in hand with what has happened during Habitat Summit previously in Turkey, then with um, NATO Summit in 2000s, and probably with G20 this year that we will see, there is this cleanup of the city, be it from migrants, be it from the stray animals, uh, be it from the poor communities. And this is the Olympic Stadium, I think, is a, is a good example on that. So I'm reminded of when you showed this, like this godlike feature of the a speech by China Meville um, called Limits of Utopia. And actually there, he mentions that we shouldn't necessarily think that utopias are actually for good, because there may be very bad utopias, and actually what we live now is one of them, because actually this is the utopia of the ruling class. So this is the kind of godlike uh, strength they have. They fly over with helicopters, they see something, and they have the financial, economic, political power to, to change things. So the question is, well, how does the reconfiguration of the social, physical, cultural aspects come together to stop this beyond being reactionary attempts? Hmm. <laughs> um. I think you, you do have a panel. Unfortunately, I won't be able to join you for the rest of the week. I'm leaving for Germany tomorrow morning. Um, you do have a panel on radical democracy, and you will have people from Rojava, right? I think Rojava experience is really important. I mean, I'm not just going to give Rojava as an example, but 
Um, I mean, there are, uh, I think in parts of uh, Kurdistan, there are experiments with alternative ways of organizing a society. Um, in Istanbul, I think Gezi, Gezi protest and park was part of that, partly an answer to that. I mean, first, uh, first you have to say, stop, enough, right? And that's what Gezi park was about. Um, and it, it was really interesting, you know, when that happens and how that happens, because six months prior to Gezi Park demonstrations, there was another call by the same group of people, Taksim Solidarity, uh, for Gezi Park, the same issue, the same uh, group of people calling people to the park. We were just around 100 people in the park. I mean, that's, that's really, for me, one of the most interesting things about Gezi Park protests. So what happened in those six months that actually made people say enough and I'll be there. I mean, we were all caught off guard. I mean, you know, all of us on the streets were not expecting that, right? Anyway, that, that's another discussion, but I think that's important in terms of also social movements. What happened in those six months that actually triggered that, right? So I think that's, in that sense, I take protests or movements like Gezi Park very important, and it was reactionary, but first you need that reaction. Right, um, which you didn't have six months. I mean, there were different movements, neighborhood movements, this and that, but uh, just as a collective uh, movement, that was that that was important. So that that was a sort of the stop message. Uh, but after that, no, I, I completely agree that there should be alternatives. There should be uh, ways of talking about uh, sort of alternative again, making other worlds possible. But for me, as someone teaching and thinking about these issues and living in Istanbul, um, I take this sort of knowledge production seriously. That's one of the things that we do, right? So in that sense, I find um, sort of this turning this gaze to the upper classes very important. And rather than normalizing and aestheticizing the residential settlements of the, of the upper classes, we need to produce more knowledge about those kinds of settlements. We, we, should, I mean, we should keep on talking about the problems of that rather than just problematizing squatter settlements. And I think in yeah, this sort of Anthropocene debate, I think we need more collaborative work of social anthropologists with um, more sort of um, engineers or physicists or material scientists. Um, I mean, we, we, need to, we need to count, we need to measure, we need to say something about the environmental damage of these kinds of gated communities. Um, so we really need to, I think, provide a different framework within which to start imagining a new kind of city, right? I mean, this has been so much normalized. I mean, we can't even, I mean, now when I, when I talk to some of my students, now, now that I'm getting older, it's becoming more and more difficult to talk to them about the problems of gated communities. Many of, some of them, not many, some of them have been born in these gated communities and they ask me, so what, what's wrong? What's, what's your problem with these people? I said, I don't have a problem with the people. <laughs> I, <laughs> They think I have a problem with their parents. I don't. I, but they, they've normalized this so much. So it's, it's a huge challenge to turn the table, really. Um, but I think that that's a very important starting point to even start imagining a different, different possible world. So that's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware that I'm just telling you a starting point. Uh, but I think Rojova example or, or some of the experimentations in um, in, in Kurdistan, again, I'm, uh, we should be careful not to romanticize all of these things because I think, uh, I mean, although they are providing a very powerful critique of capitalism and, and so on, I, we really need to see some of these projects in action, whether it's really happening or not. But, um, uh, but there are very sort of proactive projects that are being implemented there. So, so I, I wish I could stay for that panel. But. Uh, hello, I'm Amelie from Entite. Um I was wondering if you could say a bit more about resistance um, in these squ 
quarter settlements and, and the gated communities maybe as well. Um, we've been told on a very, very amazing walking tour of, of some of the central urban transformation projects on Saturday that the sort of the initial movement of resistance, at least in central Istanbul, was a bit of an elite movement of urban intellectuals. Well, maybe not elite, but at least, you know, a core of urban intellectuals. And we, of course, know that Gezi Park has become much broader and bigger than that and has surely also, you know, included a lot of the grassroots and maybe people from such spaces. But I was wondering if you could say something about both organized as well as everyday resistance in those spaces. Yeah, resistance, that, that's a tough question for two reasons. I mean, not, not question, but as, a, you know, as resistance movements, I mean, organizing resistance movements and who participates, who doesn't, and why, and why not. The, um, many scholars, when, when these urban transformation projects started, many scholars, activists were very excited about some of the neighborhood associations. Uh, and they were counting on resistance movements. You know, it's going to happen now. You know, it's, it's the time for the revolution. It's going to happen now. Um, but we saw that in, in some, some of these neighborhoods, uh, although the resistance started, it failed. And I think it's important to understand why it failed. It has a lot to do with, and some people have written about this, Tuna Kuyucu from the sociology department here has several articles about this, why resistance and some of these neighborhood associations fail. It has to do with um, the legal structure and the property regime uh, in the squatter settlements. Because they are not really homogeneous uh, places in terms of population. Some people have, they own the property, some of them are renting the property, and some of them have these so-called legal documents that are quite shaky. So they have this document paper saying that they have the right to use the land. They don't own the house, but they have the right to use the land. Um, but that, that document can easily be taken back from them. So they couldn't count on that as a legal document. So organizing or mobilizing a resistance movement in a neighborhood where you have this really mixed property regime, I mean, some people have more to lose than the others. I mean, they have to agree with the, with the mass housing administration, otherwise they, they would be left with nothing, right? So one option is to agree to go along with the mass housing administration, and if they could pay, um, they could own the, the house, and maybe they'll survive. But they don't have the other option, and they don't have anything to count on. Well, the owners, or the ones who have a bit more proper title deed, uh, they, they did resist. But they resist not because they were against the urban transformation project, but they wanted to have a better deal with the Mass Housing Administration. So it's a very complicated picture. And the property regime has a lot to do with that, and the history of squatter settlement, what it means, and, and so on. So. Um, also, we, we, can't, we can't really romanticize or we can't expect or we can't be angry to people who didn't resist. They had all the good reasons not to. Uh, in, in that squatter settlement that we worked in, you know, that was the first sort of naive question that I asked people. So why, why didn't you resist? And, and one, of, one of these sort of people that, that I was interviewing, he, he said, well, are you Kurdish or Turkish? I said, I'm, I'm Turkish. He said, look, my dear, if I resist, I become a terrorist. If you resist, you become an activist. <laughs> so that's, that's, I think that says obviously a lot about, you know, who can resist under what conditions. So it's very important, I think, to be self-reflexive about social class, ethnicity, and also the property regime, you know, ownership, who owns what, and what kind of resistance can you uh, mobilize around around this puzzle. This doesn't mean that resistance cannot happen, uh, but there are different conditions. So you can't be angry at people. I mean, during Gezi Park protests, everyone talks about uh, wh whether the Kurds were there or not. I think the more interesting question is whether the neighborhood associations were there or not. Most of them were not there. 
and they, they would be the usual suspects, right? I mean, there's something happening in the urban context. People trying to protect an urban space and you would expect neighborhood associations who are very active in their neighborhoods against urban transformation projects. They would be the usual suspects, but many of them were not there. And we need to understand why they were not there. Um, and, th and that has a long answer, but I think that that's an important question. So many people focus on, well, whether the Kurds were there or not, you know, this and that. But I, yeah, I find that sort of neighborhood association, what kind of solidarity um, uh, we had during Gezi protests, that, that's a, I find that a more interesting uh, question. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm so grateful with your talk. I am from Ecuador. And uh, even if you are not talking about Kurdish problem as if they were indigenous, but you are talking about a min minority, and in some way um, it works in the same way. And your framing is useful for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that inspired me is to how to think about culture. Because sometimes we, we say or we thought that this kind of uh, state uh, strategy to appropriation of land or um, having advantage about the rent, etc., etc., cetera, et cetera, all of this uh, economic uh, interest in behind this or this uh, modernization project or capitalist strategy is destroying culture. I can, I can, the first impression is that, okay, the objective could be to destroy, de destroy to the other, no? Indigenous or the culture of the indigenous people or the culture of the Kurdish. But I think that the objective is to destroy the material base of how they organize or they so, or organize themselves in order to survive. And that it was so uh, visible in your case. No, um, they don't care about the culture at all. At the end, if they destroy, if they change the material basis of how they organize themselves to survive, to produce, to, okay, then they exacerbate the, and destroy the culture. The culture. So I think it could be interesting. That is my what I received from you, not how to think about culture uh, when capitalism is so aggressive and all the system is acting and using the discourse and the legally instruments to appropriate of the, on the material way of so organize the social life, whatever it is. Actually, that's, that's what I would also call culture, yeah. I mean, the uh, ways of, I mean, that's part of urban culture or cultures. I mean, there is no one urban culture, right? I mean, that, so that's, that in a way, that is what we are losing in this process. The, um, yeah, this kind of transformation. So I think I'm, I'm saying that I agree with you, that it is, it is a way of, destroying culture, not in the sense of the sort of romantic view of culture, but um, in how people socially organize themselves in the city, you know, think of a migrant, that is, that is the culture that they produce in the city, right? So we, we can't really think of an essentialist culture, right? But what, what they, so this way of existence, the survival strategy is what I would call culture and what many anthropologists call culture, working in the urban field. So that, that is what actually we are losing, um, not the sort of folkloric essentialized view of culture, but the sort of survival strategies that people have developed over time. And that's what I try to explain when I say it's organic. And if you could offer a better term, I'd be very happy. I mean, the sort of more sort of organic unfolding of again, surviving in the city. How do you do that? Um, so that's that's what's happening, I think. Hi, I'm Ibrahim, a master's student from uh, University of Manchester. Um, I'm one of these places 
Thanks very much for this inspire, inspirational uh, speech and uh, place. I was born in one of these Gejekonto places, and the question how people survive, basically, as I first said, people have no alternative other than have solidarity. When there, as capitalism has its own uh, illness, there's unemployment, especially in this sort of area, or low wages, people go and buy in the corner shop without paying, in a way it's a credit system. In order to move them into another place, as state and the state authority blames these people as terrorism or drug dealing or prostitution, seeing all these evils in this sort of area, but unfortunately, that is not the case. As we can see on the screen, these people are the people of the working class, sons and daughters, and they express their oppressions through Gezi Park. That's one of the interpretation of the Gezi Park. And it is evident, it is not the need of the people, that's why they are moving, but it is the profiteering from urbanization or urban transformation, unfortunately. Therefore, the social movements, some of the colleagues are asking, it seems we are, ne we are not left any more options other than overthrowing this oppressive regime. One way or the another, we have to stand, we have to struggle, and we are in resistance. It's not only academia, just speaking here, but we are in resistance in everyday life, one way or another. We are resisting, and I believe we will, one way or another, we will win. Well, thank you for your optimistic <laughs> note. I, as I said, I mean, last month I, I wouldn't agree this much, but this month I do. Um, after the elections, I do. But, but I also want to um, add something. Um, I think rightly so, as academists, activists, or people living in these neighborhoods, we, we have been concentrating, focusing on people who have been losing in this process, in urban transformation projects. But there are so many people uh, who, who actually who see themselves as winning in this process. And I think it's also important to understand why they see themselves as winning. I mean, I, I don't agree. I, mean, I think we're all losing in this process. But we need to understand, because that was, that was the, the, one of the shocks in previous elections, how come the ruling party managed to get so many votes from also working class neighborhoods, or lower middle class neighborhoods, or middle class neighborhoods. Uh, in that um, public housing project that I showed you, we also interviewed people who moved there from, other, from another squatter settlement, which is not a Kurdish settlement, but they are coming from the Black Sea coast. So in terms of squatter settlements, these, this group is also coming from a squatter settlement, but they're a bit of a more lower middle class. They have a bit of a more stable jobs, uh, but they, they didn't want to see the Kurds around them. They were so happy when the Kurds left. And they saw themselves as actually winning in this process. So they managed to own an apartment building in this new settlement and managed to kick the Kurds out. So they were quite happy and they were voting for AKP because they saw themselves as winning in this process. So we shouldn't really have this picture of um, sort of squatter settlements versus the, the ruling party in a way. Um, because there are also differences within, as I said, there, there's a sort of social stratification within um, uh, squatter settlements, and also there are ethnic differences. And, and they are very important in terms of, you know, who can live together with whom and under what conditions. Okay. Um, okay. 
My, my question is not in the central part of your presentation, perhaps not your uh, expertise, but I want, at the beginning you said about this trauma with ecological anthropology, so I wanted to hear why was it so traumatic, because I, I've read some of them and I like them, so I want to understand why anthropologists were traumatized by them. I like the work of uh, Marvin Harris, mm. uh, the witches and the pigs and all these things, and then he has, for example, some arguments. He says, okay, the Aztecs were eating humans in huge sacrifices because they lacked protein and because the ecosystems could not support uh, animals. So I can understand that this is a little bit deterministic, but I don't, I don't understand why is it traumatic. And I'm trying to understand wh whether there are anthropologists today that are trying to get something useful out of this type of ecological anthropology, because I think there are nice things that they're trying to understand how the ecosystems and our adaptation to them affect certain social practices. Thank you, uh, Ashish Kotari from India. I just came in, so hello to everybody. Um, but the process you described about uh, gated colonies and what's happening, it's actually so similar to what's happening in India, uh, which you may be familiar with. Uh, and also, again, this, uh, you know, the, the imagery of green housing and wake up to the call of birds and stuff like that. I mean, it's all very similar. I don't think we've used, I haven't seen an advertisement as blatant as the one that you showed at the end, but they're fairly similar. Um, what I was wondering was whether you have developed or it's possible to actually uh, maybe have some collaboration on developing the sort of, in terms of the principles and values of what would be an organic city process or urbanization process. I like the word organic, I think I'm fine with that, versus what's being imposed. So for instance, resilience versus fragility, at least in terms of the poor people uh, and the environment. Um, direct radical democracy versus imposed technocratic, if one can even call it democracy or whatever rule and so on, so, so that we're actually able to develop a narrative which may be able to appeal to a much larger number of people, not just the victims, but also others. So I don't know if you actually develop something like that. And any thoughts on that would be very useful. Thanks. Uh, well, I, I haven't really developed a full-scale sort of um, uh, that kind of a um, framework, um, but um, uh, that is, in a way, what, what I'm also simultaneously trying to work on. I mean, I've been collaborating with um, Teresa Caldera, who works on Sao Paulo on gated communities. And, um, but I mean, I, I concentrated for a long time on, um, although there is this international literature on gated communities, um, it's very recent that we actually started discussing that in, in the Turkish case. So that, that has been part of my effort and energy, trying to problematize gated communities and, and trying to talk about why it's a problem. Um, but but what, what you're suggesting is very important. That's why I, 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 I think of the Kurdistan case as very important in terms of sort of grassroots mobilization, alternative ways of creating cities and, and so on. Uh, but that discussion also needs to take into account workings of capitalism, some of the exercises that I've heard and suggestions that I've heard are, I think, I mean, I shouldn't call them naive, but it doesn't, um, doesn't really engage with the workings of capitalism. Um, so it's tough, it's difficult, but it's worth trying and, and also looking at different examples in different parts of the world uh, and um, theorizing and coming up with alternatives. I mean, right now, I don't have that kind of a framework, but that's really, I think, the way to go, really. Um, in terms of Marvin, Marvin Harris, we're not really traumatized by Marvin Harris, but the, um, uh, the trauma has more to do with, I would say, history of anthropology, in a way, especially history of physical anthropology. Um, and it's uh, complicity in colonialism, racism, and, and all that. And, um, and also, I mean, the kind of work ecological anthropologists have been accused of um, reductionism, not asking any additional questions regarding power, history, colonialism, and, and so on. So I think that that's part of the problem. But I think what happened in many anthropology departments, I mean, I'm more familiar with the North American context, is that they had what I call 
nasty divorce, they stopped talking to one another at some point. I mean, when I was a graduate student in the 1990s, th there wasn't any ongoing conversation. Um, I mean, I went to Berkeley, and we heard that, that me, you know, when I was there, you know, Stanford, they split the departments. They just split the department into two. Um, more sort of uh, physical anthropologists and social anthropologists, and they stopped talking to one another. It's only recently that they reunited. I mean, that also obviously has a lot to do with the use of resources and, and so on. The dean, I, I think, pushed them to do that. Um, but it was really a very nasty divorce that they had. Um, but I think now that's why you know, I thought Anthropocene debate is interesting, because it is calling for a new kind of dialogue between social anthropology and, um, and physical and natural sciences, let me put it that way. And I think, I mean, Anna Singh, I think Povinelli and many people are actually going in that direction. Um, and what they are going back to is not necessarily Marvin Harris kind of uh, questions, but probably posing new kinds of questions, but trying to have a conversation uh, with it too. And I think <coughs> the problem is that that kind of end of dialogue between ecological anthrop anthropologists and um, others, social anthropologists, um, also had a lot of damage, I think. Because now I think that the, the pendulum really went the other way. Now I ask some of my graduate students, for example, you know, they've been doing some work on urban transformation. You know, they talk about subjectivity, governmentality, all this sort of high theory. And I, I ask them, well, how many people live in this neighborhood? They can't answer that question. They are so much in this sort of high theory, this and that, and Deleuze and Foucault and, and so on. But, you know, these are really basic questions. You know, I, I'm trying to convince some students to actually count, measure the amount of water that is consumed in one neighborhood, right? They, they shy away from that. I, I think that, I mean, it, it has to do with that still, I think the consequence, children are suffering from the nasty divorce, let me put it that way. <laughs> I think it's time to go back, and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about collaborative work. Um, we can s ask new and, and uh, common sort of questions that will be exciting for, for everyone who are part of the project, taking into account of history, capitalism, colonialism, but counting, measuring, and you know, doing um, also that kind of research as well. But still, that, that's a challenge, let me tell you. I mean, they can go on and on about subjectivity, but would have difficulty telling you how many people live in that neighborhood, so, or what they eat, for example. You know. okay. thank, thank you, Eifer, for this really inspiring talk.